All right. This week we're going to talk about um, nationalism versus cosmopolitanism, and to some extent, nationalism versus universalism. Uh, this is a return from some of the very specific issues that we've been talking about, uh, things like health policy, in the past couple of classes, <clears throat> to a couple of more general theoretical issues. And the reason for this is that for the past couple of classes we've been talking about things like poverty that have application within a particular political society. And as long as you don't think political societies are, the boundaries between them are important, um, you know, they, they, they play sort of the same role whether you're looking at them from a global perspective or from an individual perspective. But as we move forward to talk about things like human rights and talk about things like warfare that are inextricably linked up with um, the ways in which societies interact, it's important for us to go back to the well of some of the theory uh, and, and look at a little bit in more detail how we want the political community to be constituted. The other way you can think about where we're shifting a little bit here is that to some extent we've been talking about we've been talking about policy but we've been talking about it in terms of not specifically in terms of political morality just in terms of morality generally speaking. We haven't talked a lot about what kinds of political institutional structures, what kinds of polities and communities are morally appropriate, morally ideal, or morally acceptable. Uh, you know, so for instance, when we talk about poverty, a lot of the focus, even when we were looking at policy, the, the frame for the focus was to a large extent about what are my obligations as an individual towards other individuals who are less well off than I am. Okay, so here we go big issues. The first thing is that most straightforward moral theories look universalist on the face of them. So think about the things we've talked about. Um, you know, utilitarianism says promote the greatest good for the greatest number. It doesn't, nowhere in there does promote the greatest good for the greatest number of Americans uh, have, a, have a place. And in fact it would be very odd to even try to find an inherent place for something like that in utilitarianism. If you are, for instance, a Benthamite, and you think that the summum bonum, the greatest good, is maximizing pleasure, then you have a real problem explaining why you should care about whether someone's an American or a French person or a, you know, Botswanian. You'd say, well, look, Botswanians feel pleasure and pain. Why, why could you possibly, when you're doing utilitarian calculations, why could you possibly care whether um, the, the pleasure that would be realized would be in America or in Botswana? Similar things for, for, for liberal theories. Um, a number of liberal theories basically assume that you're talking about something that looks like a nation state. But it's not clear why. We've talked about this a little bit uh, with, with some of Pogge's extensions of Rawls. Pogge is a cosmopolitan, and Pogge basically, um, or he's a universalist. I haven't introduced the, the term uh, cosmopolitanism yet. My apologies. Pogge's a universalist, um, and, uh, you know, that's exactly how he extends Rawls in a lot of ways. He says, well, all right, Rawls sort of talks about we've got this veil of ignorance where everyone in a society comes together and decides, but really we should think about the world as if the ideal system was one that looked like everyone on the planet came together and decided what the global political structure was going to, to be like. And again, even someone like the libertarians, right? If you read Nozick, or if you read the discussion of Nozick and Kimblicka, one of the core things that libertarians defend as a role for the state, you know, one of the, 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 the small number of things that distinguishes them from anarchists, or at least anarcho-capitalists, don't hurt me anarcho-communists for saying you were like libertarians, one of the few things that distinguishes them from anarcho-capitalists is that they say, well, the state can have a police force and a military to protect you from external threats. But if you read something like Nozick, there's not a lot of discussion about 
why we should assume there are external threats. And like the liberal egalitarians like Pogge, you can imagine that if you were really looking at things as a sort of libertarian contract from a global perspective, you would say, well, the ideal world is one in which we don't need armies because there are no borders and there's no external threateningness, right? There's no reason why libertarians would draw, there doesn't seem to be any inherent reason why libertarians would draw any borders whatsoever. You would have, you know, a single, you know, you'd have a single overarching political system, you know, maybe you'd be federalized or whatever turns out to be instrumentally useful, but you would have a single overarching system um, that essentially functions as, uh, you know, that has only a police force, basically. You know, even when Nozick talks about regional protective associations, on a pure libertarian standpoint, this might just as well be something more like local and regional police forces than like militaries. Uh, you know, in the libertarian ideal world, presumably those police forces wouldn't fight with each other, so you wouldn't need anything that looked military-like. Um, and so it looks like the main thrust of um, most moral theories is that it does not matter who you are or where you are situated in the political system. Moral obligations cross anything arbitrary like uh, like political boundaries, like nation-state boundaries. So the problem with this, or at least the prima facie problem with this, is that almost everyone, almost all of us have intuitions that are not universalist in nature. Almost all of us feel like it is morally appropriate, if not morally obligatory, to do things like favor our own family members, favor our own religious or ethnic community, um, favor our own co-nationals over people who are outside of these boundaries. So, uh, you know, not to an unlimited extent, Right? Most of us don't think, well, if uh, it serves the interests of uh, you know, America to kill everyone else on the planet, we should do that. Right? Most people don't believe that kind of thing. But they do believe things like, you know, uh, I mean, look at um, any discussion of national security. Right? We talk about things in terms of what promotes American security and American interests. And uh, if somebody said, look, uh, I agree with you that um, taking a strong military stance against Iran is likely to you know, delay their nuclear program and make America and its allies more safe. But, you know, we need to balance this against the fact that it will make Iran and its allies less safe. Um, you know, maybe we, should, maybe we should, should take on making America less safe so that we could help out the Iranians more, right? Anyone who said that, you, it's a pretty good, could pretty good bet that they, you know, you you would assume that they are either Iranian, uh, crazy, or a philosophy professor, right? If an American said that in a national security discussion, most people would look at them as if they were saying something completely bizarre. Uh, you know, even though from a moral standpoint, all they're doing is something straightforward. They're just saying, look, we should treat Iranian interests, the interests of Iranian people, exactly the same as the interests of American people. Um, family is possibly even a stronger example of this, where, you know, if somebody really wants to treat, uh, you know, Iranian interests the same as American interests, you might think, you know, ISEP students might go around and say, well, they're naive, but we might have a kind of vague moral admiration for that sort of person. We might think, oh, well, you know, they're, they're a principled internationalist. Uh, you know, I think they're, uh, you, you might think that they're, they're odd, they're outside of the mainstream, but, but um, a lot of people would, would not think they're a bad person. Family, you know, I've mentioned this in class before, if I were to say, look, I, I've got this daughter, but really I should just give money to the neediest children um, and food to the neediest children that, I, that, I, that I'm aware of, uh, not privilege my daughter in the you know, giving of food or clothing in any way, most people would 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 not just say, "Oh, you know, that's an that's an interesting moral perspective," right? Most people would say, "Well, I'm, I'm that that I was actually a bad person for for doing that." Um, okay. So the question is, the first question really is, what do we do about this? Um, what do we do with the fact that a number of our straightforward moral theories seem to run very hard up against these kinds of intuitions? 
And one thing to keep in mind is that there's at least two ways of framing this concern. One is universalism versus particularism. This is the, the general theoretical version of the concern, which is, is it possible? Could we make morally respectable any kind of personalistic connection? Any kind of connection that has to do with the fact that I am a particular person in a particular place in the world with particular relationships that, from a broad universal standpoint, don't look important, right? So in other words, I, Daniel Levine, recognize that from the universal standpoint, my relationship to my wife or to my daughter is no more important than anyone else's relationship to, to their spouse or their children, right? You know, if, if I was looking from a, from a bird's eye view, I would, I would say, well, there's not anything special about this to the universe. But nonetheless, am I, am I allowed to be particularistic in making my own moral decisions? Am I, Daniel Levine, allowed to take special, take these things into special consideration even as I recognize that they don't have any universal specialness? So that's the universalist versus the particularist concern. More specifically, and what we're actually going to spend a lot more of the time talking about in this lecture, more specifically is the cosmopolitan versus nationalist uh, distinction. So cosmopolitans say specifically that national boundaries have no moral value, or at least no inherent moral value. Whereas nationalists say, no, national boundaries, at least typically, do have some inherent moral value. This is a little bit different from, a, from, from the, the general universal particular thing, because it has to do specifically with this issue about the boundary of nation states. You could be a particularist, but think, for instance, that nation state boundaries are not particularly important, right? So imagine someone who believes that um, ethno-cultural connections have strong moral importance. That kind of person might say, yeah, you are perfectly morally justified in favoring people from your own cultural group over outsiders to that cultural group. But if that cultural group, you know, crosses the, the, the national border between the U.S. and Mexico, say, you have no moral requirement to favor, you know, Americans over Mexicans or, or, or vice versa. Or if it crosses, you know, Ethiopia and Kenya, or you know, pick any place in the world where there are ethnocultural groups that cross uh, that, that cross national borders. So you could be a particularist without being a nationalist. All nationalists are a kinds of are a kind of particularist. All right, hopefully that makes sense. Um, we are largely going to focus on, as I said, on the the question of is it possible to defend nationalism in some way. Uh, in some morally respectable way. Ra but we are going to refer to some of the more general sorts of things. And fundamental to the nationalist question, and really what drives especially the communitarian assault on liberal cosmopolitanism, is this question about whether or not you can build political community out of autonomous freestanding individuals. Another way of thinking about this is the question of, is a political community just a bunch of individuals who happen to live in the same place and have some institutions that bind them, or is the community something more metaphysically and morally weighty, something above and beyond the individuals that are involved in it, that has its own moral standing, perhaps? So what could justify nationalism? You know, how could we if, we, if we wanted to, you know, assuming for the moment that the intuition that many people have that the nation state is important, or at least often important, what could possibly justify this? How could we make this sound morally respectable in the face of moral theories that don't seem to have an obvious place for it? Um, there are at least two lines of argument that, and Miller talks about these, that you could use to try to justify nationalism from within a morally universalistic framework. Um, so this is, this is an attempt to, to say, 
nationalism is okay, but it's only instrumentally okay. I think this is like small n nationalism. You can favor your own nation state, but only because um, in some way doing that helps promote universal moral values more effectively. So this is not the full-blooded nationalism. This is, in a sense, not full-blooded nationalism. This is not capital N nationalism. Um, in the sense that it doesn't give the nation-state any inherent moral importance. And in general, you can use these kinds of strategies to try to justify other sorts of um, particularist-like kinds of moral theories by saying, well, it's not that the nation-state, or the family, or the ethnocultural group, or the religion have any inherent moral standing, it's just that favoring people in them ultimately helps you pursue universal morality more effectively, more efficiently. So, the first kind of universalist attempt to justify some kind of nationalism would be to say that states are sort of like associations. Right? Universalist theories don't, in, don't typically have any big problem with special obligations that arise from particular associations you have. Right? So universalist theory typically won't have any problem with you being bound by a promise. Not because your promise is any more important than any other promise, but just because it's the promise that you made. Right? There's a universal rule that each person keeps his or her own promises. So it's not anti-universalist to say that other things equal, if I have promised to help someone, I ought to help them versus, you know, I ought to help them before I go and help anyone, at least in sort of roughly similar need of my help. You know, most theories have, have rules about what can overwhelm or, or, or supersede promises, right? If I promise to, if I promise to teach class, but then, you know, there's a, horrible car accident and I and and I'm the only person available to help people out of it you know you would all say oh okay that's that's fine but generally speaking voluntary associations voluntary commitments like that are not ones that universalist theories have a problem with and universalist theories also typically don't have a problem with obligations that are, might arise out of um, less voluntary kinds of connection and association. So even if I don't agree to, um, you know, if, even if I don't agree to enter into some kind of interaction with you, especially if that interaction is harmful to you, I might have a special obligation to, um, to help undo that harm before I do other things. So, um, for instance, <coughs> pardon me, if, uh, you know, certainly if this is direct, right, if I've stolen from you, many universalists will say, well, look, obviously I have an obligation, again, other things equal, obviously I have an obligation typically to give you your money back before I give that money to charity. Even if the people in charity might, the, the people I would be in charity might be in more need of it than you, right? Only certain kinds of radical utilitarians would, uh, y you know, would say, "Oh yeah, well, what you should do is steal from wealthy people and and give to you know give to the to the poor, right? You know, be be Robin Hood for Oxfam, right? That's a be a particularly radical version of utilitarianism would would be almost the only theory that would endorse something like that. Most universalist theories would say, if I've harmed you. I owe you restitution before I go off and do nice things for, for random other people.